Yep. Uh, so hi everyone, welcome back to <laughs> Toronto Data Workshop uh, for the for the spring uh, for the spring term. Uh, today it's a great pleasure to have Abel Broder from the University of Ottawa uh, present to us. Uh, some of you will know that there's there's a Nobel Prize in economics, and for a range of reasons, some people find that it's funny that there's a Nobel Prize in economics because it wasn't wasn't one of the originals, and so its full name is the Nobel, Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. And people get upset about this because they say, oh, it's not a real Nobel and all the rest of it. And, and I got upset as well, but I got upset because I always, I always, um, I didn't like the economic sciences bit. Um, I never felt that economics was a science. Um, and, and that was what I got upset about the, the economics Nobel. But over the past 10 years, um, 10 or 15 years, there's been a bunch of people um, who have been trying to change that. Uh, they've been trying to make uh, economics credible, make economics a science, and one of, of those people is, is Abel. Um, Abel is an associate professor. He runs this thing called the Institute for Replication. He is one of the few people that is using tenure the way it was intended to be used, in my opinion, and it's a great pleasure to host him and hear about his latest project, um, Mass Reproducibility and Replicability, A New Hope. So thank you very much, Abel. Wow, that was an amazing introduction. Now I feel bad that my presentation is going to be terrible in comparison to this. Um, thanks a lot, Ron. This is great. Happy to present. Um, I feel really ashamed because I've tried my best for like half an hour yesterday to try to fit in all the co-authors that we have on this project into one slide. And I fell. It was a huge mess. This is joint work with 350 amazing co-authors. Um, some of them are virtually attending, so they can answer your questions. Um, but this is a huge project with so many people. And like, you know, don't listen to Ron. My share in this is, is very small. Um, but um, what I'll do during this presentation is at the beginning, I'll, I'll go a bit over what the Institute for Replication is, because that's truly what generates the data that we're going to be using in this project. And then at the end, I'll, I'll present some of the results that we have from this first paper that is now publicly available. Um, I'm not really good at looking at the chat. Now I see someone writing something in the chat. There you go. The Nobel Prize in uh, in economics, uh, the way it should be uh, should be labeled, um, or should not be labeled. Uh, but anyway, just jump in at any point if you have questions, please um, interrupt any questions, comments, anything at all. This is an ongoing project. Um, so any feedback would be amazing. All right. Um, I guess let me start by by talking about about replications in general and reproduction. Um, during this presentation, I guess I'll do my best. I'm not really good at this, but when I say reproduction, I mean using the same data. When I say replication, I mean using new data. Most of what we do is reproductions. Um, so it should be called the Institute for Reproduction, I guess. Um, but anyway, um, I'll do my best to, to see reproduction when I mean using the same data and replication when, when we're using new data. But the point uh, the point here that I want to make in this slide is just, uh, I guess, the reason why I've been interested in the subject matter. Um, I guess, you know, as Ryan said, uh, the idea is to try to make um, discipline like economics, political science, sociology, uh, psychology, other disciplines uh, being more scientific. Then I believe that reproduction and replication is is one of the things that you need in order to make a discipline more uh, scientific, let's put it this way. Um, in my own discipline, uh, in economics, in a given year, there's something like maybe 20 comments being published. Uh, these would be reproductions most of the time. Um, it's quite rare. Most people don't wanna do reproduction, don't wanna do replications, don't wanna publish comments. Um, and journals are not interested in publishing those. The same in political science, the same in so many disciplines. Um, in comparison to the sheer size of body of work that we publish every year, the number of articles that we publish, thousands and thousands of new preprints, the share of reproductions and replication is like nothing. It's close to zero. Uh, I guess it depends on how you define reproduction and replication, but like a direct reproduction and replication almost never happens. And I guess over the years before being tenured, and I guess that goes back to what Ron was saying, before uh, being tenured, I I really wanted to do reproductions, replications. 
Um, but it's really when I got tenured and I had my sabbatical that I really wanted to do it. And I thought I would use my time to do that. Uh, and I started thinking for years before that about like, why do we have so many uh, or so few, I should say, uh, reproductions and replications. And, you know, I, I guess to me, it comes down to incentives. It comes down to potentially it's harmful for your career to actually engage directly into uh, reproducing or replicating someone's work. Um, so I think this led us into a really bad equilibrium. Um, a bad equilibrium in the sense of we don't have that many reproductions or replications in most disciplines. And when we do, most of them are negative. Negative, what I mean by that is just, let's say it's a bit adversarial or it shows that the results are not robust or don't replicate. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate because I think a lot of really positive reproductions and replications are done all the time. They're just never disseminated. Um, and I also think there's a lot of negative reproduction replications that are also never disseminated and that's not good either. So I think we're in a really bad room where we don't have that many reproductions or replications that are publicly available. And in addition, we mostly have negative ones that are disseminated. Um, and I really want to bring us into a better equilibrium. And, um, and in order to do this, you need to do this, in my opinion, at scale. You need to engage as many people and actors as possible, researchers, original authors, replicators, editors, and trying to change norms at scale. So that was the goal of the Institute for Replication and the reason why I started the Institute now two years ago. Um, as I said, like this is a huge project with hundreds of co-authors, hundreds of, of people all over the world who've, who've contributed to this so far, and this is ongoing. Um, but what I'm going to be presenting to you today are some of the results that we have for the first 110 reproductions and replications. Um, we started uh, with economics and political science. Why? Because this is something I understand. Uh, it's that simple. Um, and uh, we started with only recent articles. So we started the Institute in 2022, and we started reproducing things uh, that were published in 2022. And we go onwards. We're almost done with 2022. Now we do 2023, 2024. And the focus is on recent research because it's much easier to engage with original authors. I'm not saying that we should not replicate or reproduce seminal studies that have been published 20 years ago. I'm not saying this. I'm just saying the focus of the Institute is more recent. When a paper gets published, we're interested in trying to reproduce and replicate it as soon as possible. That's the idea. Something to keep in mind during the presentation. Many of the journals that we looked at um, have a data editor. All these journals have a data encode availability policy, first of all. So keep that in mind. Reproducibility rate just in terms of running the results. Uh, running the code starts so of computational reproducibility are going to be really, really high because these journals enforce a data and code availability policy, but also because many of them have a data editor. Actually, we have a data editor here virtually attending Lars Beluber, uh, and he's a co-author of this study. Um, and he's actually, his team is actually doing computational reproducibility for accepted manuscripts at, um, what, six of the journals in our sample, or five? mistaken five um but keep that in mind um here what we're going to be inter interested in doing is going to be mostly pushing this further can we detect coding errors data errors or problems with the data doing robustness checks that sort of thing so we're trying to do first a computational reproducibility but then keep moving and pushing the boundaries of actually um what we can do with that okay um in terms of the Institute as a whole, we have now collaboration with NHB, Nature Human Behavior, and Psych Science. Uh, these are direct, or let's say just collaboration with the editor in chiefs at these journals. So we mass reproduce now these two journals um, because the editor just reached out to us and we're interested in doing that. Um, the challenges are very different. Um, most of the reproductions, so now we have something like 70 papers at NHB being reproduced or replicated. Um, some of them are completed, and this led to comments, what they call matters arising, because of coding errors, data errors. Often, I would say, like, the codes don't run, the codes are missing, even though they have data and code availability policy. Um, so there's many more problems related to computational reproducibility in those other journals that are leading journals. 
Um, so the problems that we're facing, for instance, in economies, political science are potentially different than in other disciplines. So keep that in mind, I guess, during the presentation. Uh, but the goal of the Institute is to mass reproduce and replicate as many studies as possible, publish in leading journals. Okay? And as I said, the goal is to change in norms. So how do we get to a point where we can massively reproduce and replicate as many studies as possible? We need everybody to get engaged, or we need as many possible as many people as possible to get engaged in actually doing reproductions and replications. Um, the way we started back in 2022, the idea that I had in mind uh, was that we should have a board of top experts, top economists, top political scientists. And what I would do is I would get to them uh, with a list of studies and I would say, um, okay, so uh, we have a list of studies here that use publicly available data. Um, we would be interested in finding replicators, researchers uh, that are doing a PhD or have completed a PhD that could be interested in running the codes, looking for coding errors, doing robustness checks or collecting new data or uh, using a new survey that is not used by the authors, something like that. And what we would do is they would give me a list of names. I would reach out to the um, to the people that they, they suggested, and I would invite them to write for us a reproduction replication report. So there's a template that I developed, and I wanted people to use it. And then once they've actually doing that, they send me a report that tells me whether the results are computationally reproducible, whether they're coding errors, whether there's true or or not. And then I send it to the original authors. We allow them to respond, and then we publicly release at the same time, both the report and their response. That was the initial idea. Now there was a problem. The problem was that many studies actually use data that is not public, um, and there's a cost associated to it. So over time, we managed to get funding uh, from Open Philanthropy, and they allow us to pay replicators up to $5,000 if the data is not public. But other than that, we don't pay replicators. We don't remunerate people. I mean, remunerate people. Um, researchers, uh, either faculty or researchers with a PG or PG students uh, do it for free, uh, but in exchange, they get co-authorship to this paper or to next year's paper. Um, so that's the reason why people do this. And the only instance where we would pay people was when they actually need to get uh, a data set that is not public to do uh, a reproduction or replication. So that's the way we started things. Um, and then at one point, um, I started a new type of event, which is called Replication Games. Uh, it's basically uh, just hackathon where people uh, go to a specific location um, and spend the day uh, as a team to go through the codes, reproduce as much as possible, uh, do robustness checks. Um, so basically the same type of report we're interested in, but we're doing this through events. Um, so last year we had 15 events. We had 750 economists, political scientists attending these events. This year we have, I think now we're at 28 um, and it's all over the world. We had one in Toronto uh, organized by Ron uh, back in February. Uh, we had one last week at Brown in Northwestern. Uh, a month ago was UCLA Berkeley. Uh, next week we've got one in Ottawa here. Then in two weeks I'm going to Madrid. Uh, Derek Mikola was a research scientist and the institute is going to Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is going to have two or three per month um, going forward, uh, or even more, let's say in two or three years from now. But what are these events? So basically people sign up to these events. They can participate in person or virtually. Um, and about three, four weeks before the event, I assign people to a team. They're going to be a team of researchers, PhD students, faculty, that have similar research interests. It can be American politics, it can be development economics, it can be labor economics, it can be international relations, it can be, I don't know, a specific field, psychology, et cetera. Um, so then you're in a team of three to five researchers with similar interests. I'm going to propose you a few studies, maybe three, four, five, from which you need to choose one. Once you've chosen it, then you start thinking about what you want to do during the event. You want to run the codes, you want to look for coding errors, you want to do maybe specific robustness checks, maybe you want to grab uh, other type of data that the researchers have not used, that sort of thing. And then the day of the event from something like nine to five, you work as a team and you do as much as possible. 
in the coming in the following days or weeks, then people can keep working on what they've done. They wrap up the report, they send it to me, and again, I send it to the original authors for the response. Um, and then we release at the same time the report and what the original authors have to respond. Um, so these events are really, really popular, and most of the um, reproductions and replication that we end up getting are coming now through these uh, through these events. Um, most of the things that are being done there are reproduction, but we have some events now that are going to try to do replication with new data. Um, so for instance, we're gonna have uh, experimental economists uh, in Grenoble, uh, in France, uh, soon, who are going to spend the day trying to prepare online what the uh, the survey or the experiments would look like. And then after the event, they just look for participants. But most of the time, what teams end up doing is to use the same data and more look for coding errors, running the codes, robustness checks, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, these events are open to uh, anyone uh, with a PhD or doing a PhD. Um, and sometimes we also do it, uh, for instance, we had an event at the World Bank and IMF, where it was mostly IMF World Bank researchers. Um, sometimes we also have a team related to an event. So for instance, we got contacted recently by a university um, in the Amazonian rainforest. Uh, they wanted to do a game only about studies published on the subject matter, and they would have experts and so on. And anyway, so going forward, we will have events that are more like team focused, um, but usually it's more like anyone can join from uh, psychology, sociology, economy, vocal science, and then you team up with people in your own discipline and self -care. Okay, so who are the replicators? As I said, they're researchers. Um, they can decide to remain anonymous if they want to. Uh, something like, I think 13% so far of replicators have decided to remain anonymous. The decision to remain anonymous can be made after you see the response of the authors. So if you see that the authors respond and it's cordial and it's an interesting conversation, most of the time replicators put their name on it, uh, on their report, but sometimes they remain anonymous. Um, What's important is it doesn't matter if they find that the results are reproduced or replicated or there's coding errors, or it doesn't matter in terms of they will get co-authorship to this meta paper or to the next year's meta paper. So the goal is to have each year a new meta paper for NHB and psych science, it's a separate meta paper. But the goal is to try to remove incentives to do reverse piacking, if you will. Um, and we're really clear about this and the communication with the replicators, the participants to events, the goal is really to test whether the results are reproducible, whether they're robust. Um, so we want to try to remove as much as possible incentives to do reverse piacking. We have a conflict of interest policy, not super interesting, um, but uh, quite important. Um, and what's really important and, and is quite different from what other people are doing, other initiatives or networks are doing is we don't tell reproducers and replicators how to do the reproduction or replication. They have full flexibility on what they can do and how they want to do it. And the reason is simply because we are not experts on every single topic and we want them to work as a team on a topic that they understand with methods that they understand. And I'll show you later if I have the time that teams of replicators, reproducers choose topics uh, in their subfield because these are the papers that we suggest to them. But they choose topics based uh, the paper based on the methods that are used and how long or complicated the codes are to run. They don't choose papers because they think, oh, this paper is probably like a false result or I don't like this specific author and like this. Like people don't report this. When you ask them actually what people self-report is, they choose papers that they understand the methods. Um, and that's what we tell them to do. So unsurprising that they end up uh, doing this. Um, as I said, then I reach, once I have a report, I send it to the original authors, they have a chance to respond. There can be back and forth that the replicators then change their report, the authors change their report, but we try to keep it to a reasonable amount of back and forth. And then at the same time, we release both the response and the, um, the work of the replicators. Communication with authors. So the Institute, AKA myself at this point, um, is the one communicating with the original authors. So I'm the one on the behalf of the replicators who ask for more data, who ask for more codes, who share the report, who have questions, anything like this, I do it on behalf of the replicators. The reason I do this is often when the replicators contact directly the authors, they don't get a response. When I do it, I almost get always a response. 
Um, I think it's because the Institute is formalizing the process. Um, and I think it just looks more legit or whatever. Um, and authors almost always respond. Now, often they respond and they don't really have anything to say. Sometimes they provide data. Sometimes they have something to respond about the report. Um, some of them just say, well, thanks a lot for, you know, providing a report. We don't have anything to respond. Uh, sometimes they cannot respond because maybe uh, there's a conflict in the country that they're located in. Um, but anyway, some authors do provide feedback. They don't necessarily write a response that they want us to release, but they provide feedback to the author, uh, to the replicators. The replicators can take that feedback into account if they want to. Most of the time they do, but that's their decision. And about a quarter of original authors actually do write up a response and we release the response at the same time as the replicators. Remaining disagreements, uh, only for about 18% of articles. Um, and usually the disagreements, so I've manually coded this, um, the disagreements are about robustness checks. They're not about coding errors. There is no disagreement when everything runs and everything is great and robust, obviously. Um, but something like 20% of authors disagree on the validity of robustness checks. This is what people disagree about. They don't disagree, disagree about things like coding errors. They always, almost always disagree about robustness checks. And of course, these are the robustness checks where the results are not robust. Uh, these are the disagreements. When we reach out to the authors, it's actually incredibly useful. Often replication packages that are provided by the authors to the journal are useless or incomplete or uh, they don't run or things are missing. So when we contact the, uh, the authors, often we get clarifications, things that are useful. About 40% of replicators contacted through us, the Institute, the authors for clarification. Um, and two thirds of them said that it was useful, that it actually improved the quality of the report. Um, so this is good and bad. This means that it's great that the authors are actually helping us the Institute and the replicators, but it's also bad because it means that we need that their help. Their replication package was unclear or we need to actually help to run their codes. So you can see this as something positive or negative. It's a bit of both. Oh yeah, so the paper I'm talking about is the first MENA paper uh, where we have 357 authors or something like this. I forgot the number. Um, we have 110 reproductions or replications. So these are reports that are completed that we send to the original authors. So these are the first 110 that were completed by August, 2023. Um, as I said, it's very selected sample. Most of the journals have a data editor. They all have a data encode availability policy. If we would do this for a journal that has a data availability policy, but does not enforce it, we would not be able to do this. Um, so I've tried, for instance, with the Journal of Development Economics. It's a leading journal in the field of development, as you can imagine. Um, they have a data encode availability policy. They even have a registered report stream. So you would think the journal is really pro-open science. So what I did for a couple of months was to email all the authors who had published in the journal for like a six month period. And I asked them for the data encode. Um, most of them did not reply. Those that replied said, yeah, maybe I'll send it at one point. Some replied saying, but we shared it with the, the journal. They didn't post it. I was like, no. Um, some of it replied, well, we cannot really share the data. I'm like, can you share codes? Like, oh, I don't know. We don't really have the codes. My dog ate them or something. Um, so when the journal does not enforce actually the data and code availability policy, you just cannot do what we're doing here. Okay. Um, I think for journal development economics, it was something like 18% of, of packages that I managed to get my hands on. Um, and this is like all publicly available data. It's mostly RCTs and surveys that are available. So the vast majority of authors couldn't give me a package, something to work with. So keep that in mind. These are very selected journals that we're looking at here. If you would do this for top field journals and economics or political science, or let's say second tier journal, there's no way you can do this. The rates would be completely different, okay? Um, here, uh, in terms of computational reproducibility, it's incredibly high. Just running the codes and comparing what's coming out of the codes versus what's in the paper, 
we're talking about like 95% of the, of the articles, it, it works. You can run the codes and everything is great. Uh, the journals, that, the, the articles that don't, usually it's because some data is missing or some codes are missing. Uh, we reach out to the authors, they don't want to provide the proofs. This being said, many of these journals don't force that the authors provide the raw data and the, and the cleaning codes. So what we have is only intermediate codes and data, which limits what the replicators can do. So when I said we have positive, we have like 95% computational reproducibility, like really, really high. Keep that in mind that for half of these papers, it's only from the intermediate data and codes. We're missing uh, the full codes and the full data. Okay. So that's first, what we're interested in is going a step further, checking for coding errors, for data irregularities, and then doing robustness checks. We're going to have 5,000 robustness checks. Uh, I call this reanalysis. Um, what that means is we have an original point estimate from the original study, and we're going to have a new point estimate with a new p-value, new coefficient, where something has been changed. Maybe they changed the way that the model is run, the estimation method changed. Maybe they changed the way that they're doing inference. Maybe they changed the weighting scheme. Maybe the replicators change which control variables are included. Maybe they do many things at the same time, many changes. Maybe they're using new data. Maybe they change the sample. They add years, remove years. Um, they can do plenty of things. If you look at what replicators have done on, you know, as a whole, you can pretty much group this into eight things from changing control variables, changing the sample, changing the definition of the dependent variable or the independent variable, changing the estimation method, changing the methods of inference, the weighting scheme, and using new data. These 5,000 new point estimates are mostly that. So what I'm going to show you in two slides from now are going to be the original distribution of p-values versus the one with the reanalysis. Okay? But before that, let's move to coding error. In terms of coding error, again, we don't have the raw data and the cleaning codes for, like, I would say close to 50% of these studies. Um, we have only the codes for running the results, the regressions. Um, this being said, what we find is about a quarter of studies have a coding error or multiple coding errors. It By coding error, I exclude anything like changing paths or there's a package missing. By coding error, I mean, you said that the control variable is coded like this, it's not. Or you said that you cluster like this, but actually that's not what you do. Or uh, you have duplicates, or um, you have a difference in difference model, but you have forgotten to do the key interaction term. Or you say that you do an IV, but actually you're not doing an IV, you're doing OLS, whatever, like it could go on for, but these are like, these are coding errors that could lead to a change in the conclusion of this study. They're not coding errors of like, I cannot run your code. They're coding errors that are, let's say a step further, okay? Some of the errors are more than major, I would say catastrophic. Uh, so we have a study, for instance, where 75% of the observations in one of the data sets are duplicates. It's problematic because it's a paper about inequality. And if everybody is 62 years old, a woman and living in the same village, there's zero inequality in these villages. And these zeros matter for the results. So we have errors like this. We have, for instance, also a big RCT implemented by the US government with millions and millions of dollars. And the two authors who looked at that specific study, unfortunately, did not clean their data. And the randomization is at the city level. Um, and they're going to have too many clusters because instead of having one fixed effects and one cluster for St. Louis, they have many because they rolled St. Louis in many different ways. So they end up with way too many clusters, way too many fixed effects in the analysis. It's also a paper about race, and they misquoted the, the, the race of variable. So it can go from, you know, you made a mistake in coding your coding, uh, your control variable, doesn't matter too much, to, I don't know, actually we're talking about very serious coding errors. So there's a full range. Uh, there's something in the chat. Is this something that a data editor should have caught? Well, Lars is here. I'm going to say no, um, but you can, you know, disagree. A data editor's job or his research assistant job is to run the code. So it's a push button reproduction. Um, you could not, you would not be able, like 
that's not your job as a data editor to do that. It would be incredibly time consuming um, and you wouldn't know what to look for. So what the data editor does in most cases is there's the article, here are your tables and figures with your results. Is this what's coming out of the paper, of your code? That's what a data editor does. Just that is amazing. Like I'm not trying to understate what data editors are doing. It's insanely useful and amazing. But it wouldn't lead to them uncovering these calling errors for a simple reason that some of these articles were actually in studies with uh, internals with the data editor. So the data editor would not pick up on something like this. That's just not their job, in my opinion. Um, also, something that happens quite a bit is um, authors say something in the article, but actually when you look at the codes, it's different. Um, the thing that happened quite a bit, especially I think in political science, was they're using a weighting scheme, but they don't say it in the paper or it's buried in like a footnote in the appendix. But actually as a replicator, the first thing you notice when you open the codes is every line with a regression, there, there's a weighting scheme. So there are things that as a referee or an editor, you would never pick up on. As a replicator, that's the first thing you notice. And also often when it's not reported in the paper or they say something in the paper, but it's different in the codes, it turns out it matters often uh, for the conclusion, as you can imagine, not always, but um, it does matter. Um, there's also many coding decisions just buried in a footnote. Uh, I think in the paper, that last bullet point, I put it in a footnote on purpose. So I, I'm curious if people who are, who are going to read this paper are going to pick up on this. But um, a like I guess the point of this slide, to me at least, is even if the referee process, the reviewing process in academia would be perfect, you still need someone to look at the code. Um, a data editor is not going to pick up on this. Reviewers are not going to pick up on this. Uh, the editor cannot. There are things that you just have to look at the codes to understand. And when teams come to me um, and they say, hey, you know, we've chosen this study, uh, I often ask them, can you give me a pre-analysis plan of what you're thinking of doing? Um, but I always tell them, you're going to deviate from it and don't worry about it. And they're going to deviate from it because until you actually open the codes, you have no idea what you can do. And there's going to be things that are going to pop up to you that when you read the paper, you would not have thought about. When you read the paper, you think like a referee. When you actually go over the codes, you think differently and you see different things. So to me, that's the value added of what we're doing. To me, here it is, like most of it. Okay, let me move to now looking at the reanalysis. So this is something like five or 6,000 new point estimates that we have. So on the left-hand side of this slide, what you have is the distribution of T-statistics from the original studies. On the right-hand side of this slide, you have the reanalysis. This is from the replicators. Most of the time, it's the same data, but they've changed something in the, in the estimation. Okay? Let's focus on the left-hand side first. What you see on the left-hand side is it looks like a bit of two-arm shape. There seems to be some missing T statistics just below the 1.65, the 10% significance threshold. So these are the vertical bars, 10, 5, 1%. And there's more of a mass just past the 10% and really close to the 5%. In economics, it's not like medical science or psychology. 5% is not necessarily binding. 10% matters too. If I would show you this for medical journals, which I've done for thousands of articles in medical journal, the spike at 5% is huge. And there's really a value before. In economics, political science, it's more continuous. We don't see these threshold of 5% as like super binding. So that's why you're seeing more of a mass around it, but it's not necessarily just past 5% versus uh, significant at 6%. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. That's why a lot of the piaking tests that are developed in other disciplines, to me, they don't make a lot of sense in economics, political science. Anyway, beside the point. Uh, what's interesting is when you start moving to what the replicators are doing by doing robustness checks, using new data, et cetera, or changing things, you see a mass shift towards the left, towards the insignificance uh, significance region. So basically, they're bringing the p-values up or the t-statistics down. 
Um, there's a lot of action that is happening from the 5% to the 10%. There's some action that are, there's some T-stats that are super high, like 10, and they become insignificant. Um, some of them don't move at all. Some of them actually increase. So sometimes the original authors are too conservative. Um, we've seen a bit of everything. And I'll show you how this moves in a table um, or maybe it's in the paper. I don't know if I put it or not. Yeah, I'll show you in two slides from now, okay? Here, one thing to keep in mind is um, sometimes the sign is gonna flip. So the T stat could become negative. We don't show these T stats here. I can show you the similar figure in the appendix. Um, some sign actually flip. Here, they would be between like zero and one most of the time. It's rare that it flips and becomes significant in the other direction. We have a few like this, but it's quite rare. Any question about this figure? Hey, Abel, yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah. So the, the right-hand side here, is the is there just one um, reanalysis estimate? Because I remember like you mentioned, there's like 5,000 permutations. So like this is different than that previous thing you mentioned. And then second part of the follow-up, which is for those like 5,000 permutations, could you do like a, a sense of almost like a bias estimate? Like take the average T stat of the permutations and compare that to the original paper point estimate to get a bias? So so, so this, what I'm showing you on the right-hand side, this is 5,000 point estimates. Okay. So this is the Good. distribution of, test, of, of T stats and there's 5,000 T stats here. And I just smooth it and you know use different bins. You can change the bins and it would change a bit the, the way to figure what it looks like. But the, there's 5,000 point estimates here, 5,000 T curves. If you do a direct comparison, you can, and it's in the appendix uh, of the paper. But basically what you would see is one curve minus the other, and that shows you the difference. Another way that you can show this is with a table like this. So on the left column, so on the first column, you have the significance, uh, sorry, let me just remove, right? Okay, so what you have is, the first column is, is the original point estimate significant or not? Is it not significant? Significant at 10%, significant at 1%, significant at 1%. And here, what it shows you basically is what's happening, for instance, if an original significant, like if an original point estimate was significant at 5%. So look at the third row, significant at 5%. So that means the original study was significant at 5%. Where does it end up once we do a reanalysis? We change the weighting scheme or change this or change that. You see that the sign is going to change 3% of the time, 2.76. It's going to become not significant 28% of the time. It's going to move from being significant at 5% to 10%, 12% of the time. It's going to remain significant at the 5% level to 1%, 41% of the time. And it's actually going to become even more significant 16% of the time. If you look at the 10%, that would be the second row. So the original point estimate is significant at the 10%, one of these 5,000. You see that the sign will change almost 7% of the time once you do a reanalysis, a robustness check. And it becomes not significant 45% of the time. So basically, if you see a point estimate in economics or political science in one of these journals that is significant at 10%, a replicator is doing a robustness checks 45% of the time will show that it becomes not significant at 10%. Does that make sense? Is it a bit clearer what we're doing here? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So the other thing I want to talk to you about, just shake the time, I want to keep time for uh, discussion, is what's going on in terms of the FX size. So here's a figure where if it's on one, it means that the sign, uh, sorry, it means that the coefficient of the original study and the coefficient that the replicators get when they do a robustness check is the same. The coefficient did not change. When it's positive, it means it went up in size. And when it's smaller than one and even negative, negative would mean that the sign flipped. And from zero to one, it means it's getting smaller and smaller. So what you're seeing basically is for many of the point estimates, the FX size starts to reduce, rarely change or flip signs sometimes, but often also it gets bigger. So here what's happening is, and we have reports like this that basically show the original authors were too conservative. The point estimates are actually larger and more significant. 
this happens, and that's what you see on the right hand side here. But most of the time, the coefficients are a bit smaller, uh, and sometimes they're just close to zero or even flipping sign. Okay, but most of the action I would say is more about the p values than this than the fx size, the size of the coefficient in our sample, or at least with the reanalysis that we have. Okay. Um, I'm not going to show you this for each type of robustness check. You can have a look at the paper if you're interested in this. But the things that seem to matter the most in terms of making the results not significant is changing the coding of the dependent variable and changing the sample, adding years, removing years, adding countries, removing countries, uh, removing like whatever unit of the cluster or something like this. This seems to make results not significant about like half the time. Using actually new data in economics and political science usually leads to similar conclusions. Here, new data is not necessarily in a lab. It could be, well, instead of using like the CPS, like it's a way to measure like labor market flows, I would use another data set. When you do that, usually you find similar results. Even if you use a different country, usually you would find similar patterns. Um, middle range, things that matter sometimes, but not always changing control, estimation method, inference method, that sort of thing. Like the robustness reproducibility rate for these is close to like 70%. All right, last thing I wanna talk about, and then uh, I wanna keep like five, 10 minutes for the discussion. So then we had all these results and um, I wanted to answer way, 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 way too many research questions, you could argue. But anyway, I had a lot of other research questions I wanted to answer with this data set and with these results. And I didn't want to be myself just running all the analysis because maybe I'm going to be piacking, who knows? So I wanted to tie my hands. And then what we ended up doing is a many analyst type of analysis. So there's teams, six teams of researchers that I gave them a data set. And I told them the data set is what I just presented to you is the meta database, uh, these 5,000 point estimates. And I told them, use these 5,000 point estimates and answer these eight research questions. You have to use the dependent variable that I'm telling you, which is whether it remains significant or not in the same sign. But other than that, do whatever you want. Control for whatever you want. Use whatever model you want. Use new data from like controlling for whatever. Code the way you want, like what is experience here. Um, I don't care. Just give me an answer to these eight different research questions. So each team, these six teams, gave me an answer to these eight research questions. And what I'm going to show you on the next slide is a summary of what they find. But what we were interested in uh, was our reproducibility rates, these robustness uh, checks that we're doing, related to the replicator's experience coding, or just in general, their academic experience. Or is it related to the author's experience? We don't know how experienced they are at coding, but we know in general, like their academic experience. What about the interaction of these two things? What happens if you have experienced replicator versus non-experienced authors or vice versa? Then I was interested in prestige. What if the authors are from like, well, I, I don't know how people define actually prestige. So we didn't say it. The teams can define prestige the way you want. Maybe it's a prestigious uh, affiliation. Maybe they have a lot of citations, a high H index. I don't know. Teams decide. But what's the interaction between the authors being prestigious versus the replicators not being, or the other around, or maybe they're halfway or like in the middle? Um, what about like when the original authors provide the raw data? What happens? Is it less likely to be robust? That sort of thing. So these are the questions we were interested in. Now, me being dumb, I didn't realize it would be a massive pain in my to actually code the answers from these six different teams because they can define everything the way they want. So the coefficient that they gave me are not comparable. What I do know is whether they find a positive relationship and whether it's significant or not. <clears throat> the other thing I asked them, uh, each team to tell me for each research question is, is it a strong relationship or not? Um, and what we have in the paper is this table six that is a beautiful mess and I don't really know how to explain it. So I have the first two bullet points and we can read this together. So teams find a negative relationship between replicators experience and reproducibility. 
experience coding or experience just academic experience. The more replicators experience, the less they find that the results are robust. Most teams find this. There's like a consensus for that. There's also a consensus for, there doesn't seem to be a relationship between reproducibility, robustness, reproducibility, and the provision of raw data or cleaning code. So when the authors actually give us more data and more code, it doesn't seem to be related to robustness, reproducibility. That's not something I would have guessed. I would have guessed is if you give me more data and more code, it's more likely we're gonna find coding errors. It allows us to do more robustness checks. We might show that the results are not robust. That doesn't seem to be the case here. The other research question, there is no consensus. It's all over the place. Teams disagree, basically, on all the other research questions. But for these research questions, there seems to be a consensus. Replicators experience matter. And we don't seem to find a relationship in general with provision of intermediate or raw data or the cleaning codes and actually finding that the results are robust or not. All right. So usually I finish this presentation and people say, oh, we have a huge reproducibility, replicability crisis in, in the social sciences. Whereas the other half of the room is like, no, I disagree. Look at the figures. There's not that much piacking. Things are good. Yeah, there's coding errors, but it's not that bad. And usually it's sort of these two extremes. And I sort of agree with both. When I talk to people, either they think it's a huge deal or you see, it's not that bad. Uh, I can see either's point of view and I never managed to convince one of the other. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's not clear at all to me. Um, there has been a lot of studies that have tried to do mass replication with new labs and so on. And there's Colin Kammerer, Anna Dreber, Mike Johnson's team. They did a bunch of studies like this. There's the open, um, open science. Uh, they've done also uh, OSF, sorry. Uh, framework we've done large scale replication. They have replication rate of like 50%. I mean, sure, but these studies are quite old. They look at studies that are even older. It's new data. It's only experimental studies uh, with small sample size. So I don't know what to think. Here things seems to be better, but maybe they're better because we look at top journals that actually have a data editor. And if you would try to do this with journals that are lower ranked or that don't have a data that there may be things would be terrible. So if right now you're not sure how to feel, what do you think? Yeah, we have like a huge reproducibility crisis or not. I'm fine either way. I think it really depends the way you want to look at things. Um, but one thing that is really cool is we did a survey and we asked all our co-authors, the replicators, um, what are actually doing what they've done made them think more positively about their discipline? And 40% said yes. Here's the question. By that, what I mean is, by you spending a full day or multiple days on average, teams spend like five to seven days on average on the paper. Um, by spending like a week looking at someone else's code and looking at you know whether the results are robust or not, it does this have a positive or negative impact on your views of the discipline? And 40% say positive. Another 40% say, meh, I don't know, didn't change. A small percentage said more negative. And some people said, I don't know. I have no idea what you're asking me. So overall, it's quite positive. Like even if we find coding errors, we find that some results are not robust and so on. I think just doing mass reproducibility like this actually makes people think that their discipline is doing better than what they were thinking before. So I think mass reproducibility can actually and replicability can actually have positive effects just in general on the way we see our discipline, on scientific trust, but also I think more directly. Like in economics, this year we're reproducing 25% of studies using empirical data in eight leading journals. So if you work, if you're an economist and you're trying to publish in leading journals in economics, the likelihood that you will receive an email from me with a report on your newly published study is quite high. And I think that's really important because that's how we think norms are going to change. If you know someone is going to look at your codes and poke around and have a look and see whether it's result, it's robust, you behave differently. You code differently. Maybe you're going to triple check your codes. 
Um, maybe you're not going to piac as much. So the goal is by doing this, we're going to be able to get to a point where maybe what we're doing is less important. And at one point, maybe it's not going to be important at all. And people are going to be able to sell discipline by themselves. But worst case, we'd still need to do it and things just get better. Wait, worst case, that would be already quite good. So maybe it's not the worst case. But anyway, I'll stop here. Um, I didn't keep that much time. Sorry, I should stop talking. Thank you very much, Abel, uh, for a fantastic presentation and <clears throat> broadly for all of your work on this. Uh, I'll stop recording. Uh